We're here right now in this home <clears throat> for a tremendously important purpose something that is more vital to you and to me than anything you have in your life. There is nothing in your life that comes even close to being as important to this as this. Because when you go out of here, the rest of your life during this day or the next years are going to be lived in a certain way. They're going to be lived in the way you are internally. How can it be any way else than what you are to project itself in the exterior world, then you behave in a certain way, react in a certain way, suffer in a certain way, or confused in a certain way. This morning, we're going to find out how without exception, this is, this is not too good to be true, this is true, this is a fact, what I'm going to tell you. So that when you go out into the world after this meeting and for the rest of your life, there is no such thing as the unexpected. Now, to make this clear to you, you think back the last few days, last month, and see how many times a day, you have to think about this, you have to work as I'm talking, otherwise you won't make connections. You have to see how many times you met circumstances, people, internal things, maybe an emotion that was very unexpected to you. You didn't think it was going to happen. You didn't think at your work a certain thing would happen. You didn't think that in your human relations that a certain thing would happen. Now we're going to find out why we are shocked, hurt, disturbed, upset, thrown off the track by any happening at all. Because when you understand this, you really see it, there is never any such thing as an unexpected event in your life. None. None whatsoever. To get into this state, we have to find out why we meet the unexpected, why it upsets us, disturbs us, makes us nervous, makes us afraid. We have to find out why. And if we can go way back and then track it up to a daily experience, then we can start to work every day and find out See, see, you grasp this now. So that instead of there being you and an event, there is simply an event without you existing in it. Does this sound strange to you? When you go out, let's take the average person who goes out into the world this morning, tomorrow, work wherever. He does not have the slightest realization that he is constantly disturbed, constantly upset from the minute he punches the time clock at 8 o'clock till he goes to bed at night. And he'll never believe you if you tell him that in this course of 24 hours that he has been upset, disturbed, in tension, in fear, not just a dozen times, but perhaps two or three hundred times. Because he has never sat back and looked and said, I was disturbed when the company cafeteria didn't have my favorite jello. They always have green jello and all they had was orange. This thing is repeated over and over all day long in degrees. The jello is a minor thing. He can, he can take that. But there are major things which he doesn't see too. And this is what keeps him unhappy. Right. To find out how you can get up in the morning and go to bed at night without being disturbed by anything whatsoever. And this is not this is not uh, religious talk about God directing your life and keeping you 
cheery and happy because your mind is on spiritual things. This is intensely practical so that you actually live it instead of thinking about it and talking about it. So we have to now go back and find out why we're in this problem of being upset and being disturbed. And some of you are going to recognize what we've covered many times before. And I'm going to say it in a little different way. And if this is new to any of you, please do follow it. This is something brand new to, to many people. They've never heard of such a thing. Because they have very wrongly, and I might add gullibly, Taken an unhappy life for granted. Taken misery as the only thing that exists, which is completely untrue. It's untrue. It is a fact with most people, but it's an unnecessary way of living. But you don't find it out until you get tired of paying the price for being unhappy. Okay? <clears throat> you have, and I have, Hundreds of ideas about the kind of a person you are. These ideas came to you since childhood, from society, from your parents, from the church, from politics, from newspaper headlines, from your own mind, from your own ambitions. You have ideas not only about who you are, but having an idea about who you are, then you have ideas about what you should achieve and what is owed you. My father told me that I had to be a financial so social success in life, or any kind of success, religious success, success included. I therefore get the idea in my young mind, which all society will, quote, confirm, and an illusion can never be confirmed, I have an idea that I must achieve this particular success, or this particular state, and I think that I have to have it, otherwise I will not exist. This is very complex, I can't go into detail, but you have to do some work yourself. So I have the idea in my mind, dozens of them, that I have to achieve a certain kind of success. A girl is 18. And what does all of society and her other girlfriends tell, tell him? You have to get married. You have to have a family. That's the normal thing. That's how you'll be secure and happy. And of course, she finds out that it just isn't so after about six weeks. And, and the man, too. You find your own examples in your, your life because you have to connect everything that we're talking about with your life. Because this lady is different from this lady, and so on. So I have all these ideas about who I should be, even, even that I should be a nice, kindly, loving person. This is a, it's a tremendous trap already, but we don't see it, because we don't know any better. But I go to church, I read a book, and it says that I should be a kind person. Fine. In itself, it is right to be kind. It's nice to be compassionate to other people. But because I don't understand these deeper things, I simply start a very, very perfected stage performance of being a nice, kindly, considerate person to you, to my neighbor, to my nation, and so on. This is simply and nothing more than an idea, an imagination, an ideal that I have about myself. Now, the reason I have this is be uh, simply really to begin with is because I don't know any better. So I go to college, and I go for six years, and I become the, the doctor, the lawyer, or if I'm a girl, I meet the man, probably why I went to college in the first place, and meet a nice man and get married and have children. And I either make a lot of money or I'm a failure or halfway between them, doesn't mean you. But something begins to nag at me and tell me that there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. 
All right, so I made a lot of money. Maybe it's another wife or another husband or more children or less children, whatever it might be. If I reach this point where I begin to see that all this idiotic running around to political meetings and talking about God and praying and all these things have done nothing for me and I'm dreadfully honest and I see how I have nightmares, and I have so many habits that I don't want, and so many problems that I don't want. If I'm at this point, I can now begin to shatter all of my pain, all of it, no exceptions. And you'll see why in a minute. But I have to get to this point first, where I'm, what should we call it, where I'm no longer deceiving myself, where I'm no longer lying to myself and to other people. If I lie to me, I'll lie to you, right? It's all one thing. There's no, no difference. In it. I see that something real drastic has to be done, because I, I can't go on this way. Life isn't, isn't worth living. It really isn't. It really isn't worth living this way anymore. I will review briefly how, what happens with most people, and then we'll see the right thing to do. The despair has become so great, so painful, and I have no idea what to do. So I do all the wrong things. First of all, I ask, I was going to say my equally neurotic friends for advice, <laughs> which is true. <coughs> and of course, they're pleased that you have so many problems because it seems to diminish theirs a little bit. They love, they love to have you, you know, complain. <coughs> and they'll give you the advice and they're talking in their sleep because they don't know either. So you go through that stage. Now, you're no happier now. Than you're worse off, but you're better off. Because you have had the courage for the first time to see that your neighbor is as confused as you are. And you're not going to simply follow his or her advice to go down to the pastor and talk it over or read this book or that. This is just the beginning. There's, there's a lot of hard work to do yet, depending on your particular identification, where you have gone on. So you try all kind of other things, and there can be all kind of escapes. Even suicide becomes an escape. Alcohol becomes an escape. I'll tell you something else that becomes an escape. Just sitting down and feeling sorry for how badly the world has treated you all these years. And getting secret resentful against all these people who have not confirmed your phony images about yourself. Resentment against them and dreadful pain. But you don't know what to do. Here we find out what to do. When, when the pain and the despair of ever getting out of it, and even this is in, it's an advanced stage to be in a terrible crisis with yourself. It's an advanced stage, it really is. Now, but now the direction is everything. At this point, direction is everything. Because you say, I, I, I don't care what I do, I'm not going to lie anymore. I see that lying to myself has done nothing but get me deeper into it. Then, if you have abandoned your neighbor and what you have called God, called God, which is really not God at all, because God is not an idea. God is not a thought. God is not a description. God is the whole thing, which includes the mind on a certain level, in consciousness. It's the whole thing. At this point, see, the kingdom of heaven really is within. And if you've done your part up to this point of this incredible honesty, this, this, this cutting yourself off from everything and everybody, from your wife and your husband, your relatives, which most people never do, never do. It's too much. They'd rather be secure with the prison cell with a lace over it so that it looks like a mansion. You're beginning to see the bars behind those pretty laces you put up there, see? And it is, it is indeed a terrible shock, but a healthy shock to pull aside the little lace curtains and to see 
that you were actually in prison all the time and, and you couldn't get out there as you thought you could any time you want. You couldn't give up smoking any time you wanted, just as you tell your neighbors. Just very minor thing compared to some of If you will stay, get all the help you can. A right help. There's so much wrong here. You have to go through this too. If you'll stay right in the middle of this horrible situation where you're afraid of death, and you are indeed, which we'll cover in a minute too. You're afraid of being nobody, of not having anybody to support you at all in your ideas, or you're willing to be lonely, physically and psychologically, in order to understand it, not to escape it, because if you try to escape it, you'll just change cells and put blue curtains instead of red ones. Stay right in the middle of it, and if you will stay right in the middle of it long enough, something very strange will happen to you, and it'll be so faint, so faint you won't recognize it, but you have to stay right there. You stay right there. This is the beginning you want to call it the new birth, you want to call it the beginning of an authentic change of your life. Now we're going to go back to seeing what we've covered so far, how you can start to work when you go out of here, right now as you're sitting here, right now, to reach this point of total despair, where you have nothing at all. So that you were nothing but the pain itself. Because that is what you are anyway. At any, follow, at any split second that you are in anguish, this is all there is. There is no other you in existence at that moment who can work on the anguish to get rid of it, because time has gone. You see, there's no two people. You can't operate on yourself in one other hand. That's another thing. So I've reached the point, you've reached the point, where life isn't worth living this way anymore. And I'm becoming, by the way, incidentally, because I've become middle-aged by now, uh, death seemed far away when I was 20, 25, and 30. You're thinking. You must think about death, but not in, in fear, but as another tool for understanding yourself right now. Then you will understand death also. We started off by saying, when you have died to all your false ideas about yourself, then, and this is extremely practical, there cannot be anything unexpected at all. I'm not talking about the rain falling, the weatherman said it was going to be clear, you understand. We're talking about your relations with that other person. You thought he or she was going to be loyal to you all your life. You were leaning on each other. You were because you were both afraid. You were leaning on each other to give you comfort. Let's push the fear back, like pushing fog back with your hands. Do it if you can. You're going to now use all of your pains themselves in order to destroy it, which can be done. Any shock, any anguish, any unexpected event can be used to destroy it. Let's see if we can find a very simple concrete example. I have someone in my life that is important to me, say. I have a wrong relationship with this person <laughs> because, let us say, I'm depending on him or her to tell me who I am. And if I wanted to be a successful doctor or lawyer or businessman and it failed, and it's frightened me because I haven't achieved my quote, goals, which are nonsense. Then I can use this person in my life to comfort me. And now I've made another mistake. I've lost this person who has been comforting me and keeping me 
from being terrified at my other failures. Now this person deserts me. Mentally, physically, in some way. I've, I've lost a support. Now remember we said earlier, if you have lost something, anything, your health included, and if you will stay right in the center of it, without doing anything, the minute you try to do something about it, you put another lace over the bar so that you can't see it anymore. Because you have tried, you, you have insisted that this person should not have left you alone, which means you have an idea of what you were owed by him or her. <coughs> if, when this person leaves you or me, at the very instant that it happens, I am watching my reaction to this person going away. What will I see? First of all, I will see considerable distress in myself. First step. I, I see it. I, I see that I'm terribly distressed at you leaving me and leaving me scared. I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching every minute how I'm responding. Now, now I can see all kind of other things. Remember I said I loved you a year ago? You're leaving me? Do I still love you? See, I'm very angry at you. I hate you. It wasn't love, was it? But I called it that because that's what society does. But you have now left me, and now this so-called love has turned to violence against you, maybe. You see it in the paper all the time. I call it love because I, I was confused. I didn't know what love was. I was still living in vanity and, and everything else. So I see many things, and you have to do this for yourself, because you're different, you're different, you're different. Now I see all these things, and still I don't run away. Time will come when, among many, many things, which I won't go into, I see that when this shock, this unexpected thing, whatever it was, hit me, I see that I can handle it in a different way than I used to do, than I have been doing all my life. All my life I've been a, a machine that handles it mechanically. Every time you <coughs> touch my precious little picture of how wonderful I am, I used to get angry at you and, and upset. Anytime you contradicted me, because I have images of always being right, for example. I begin to see that I can respond to what you did, to what society did, to what an event did, in an entirely different way. Which is, first I see it, and then I don't do anything about it, and then I understand, this is very important now to follow this next point, that I can drop my shock, my pain, my suffering, which is in thought, or a form of thought, I can drop it the instant it appears, which is the normal and natural way for it to go. Let's see why we don't just let a thought fall away. If the thought falls away, all the anxiety falls away, and it falls away right now, right at this very instant. See, because you're thinking it at this very instant, and you're feeling it, and you're suffering from it. You know, I'll interrupt myself for a minute, you know that you can the minute you get any kind of a disturbance, that you can be free of it right now, not when you take the drink, or meet the new husband or wife, or get excited over the football game, you can be free of it right now. Now let's find out why we don't let go of this wrong thought. You want to call it negative thinking? That's fine. We could let go of it right now. We don't let go of it because we're afraid believe it or not, of the death of what we have called ourselves. I have been very successful in what, the real estate business for 20 years. And I get excited. I watch my chart. Sales up, sales up. You know, the red line going up. Great, fine. Well, I'm, I'm excited and I tell my wife about it. And I buy a new home <coughs> for status. And I really think in my confusion and my lack of knowledge of what all of life is about, that I am controlling myself. 
I'm controlling my business. Boy, this makes me excited. I'm the boss. When the chart starts to go down a little bit, I start to get anxious. Find out why. Find out why you get anxious. This is, this is wonderful. Do you know that? Really wonderful. Because I had the illusion that I was a separate self, a separate ego, a separate Tom Smith, who controls the world out there. And as long as everything was going my way, I felt affirmed in this illusion that I was controlling the world. If I control something, obviously I exist as a controller. I mean, complete illusion, and I'm headed for disaster. Even if that chart goes up to the day I die, I'm, I'm in disaster. I'm not headed for it. I'm in it. <clears throat> when the red line, after going up so fast, after several years, starts to go down, I start to get worried because I'm beginning to suspect that I'm not this great controller of all of life. And I'm afraid that it's taking something away from me, therefore it is killing me. Which is exactly what has to happen if we are to find ourselves. We have to die to the illusion that we, as a separate self, control something. Because you don't. You don't control anything. Now, now remember we covered this, I think. I'm not sure. I'll tell you very quickly how to control everything which connects with unexpected events. You can, you can indeed control all of life, completely, everything, yourself and other people. And you control it, you follow this now, I'm not saying this to sound interesting, I think, but because it's a fact, and you have to make your own connections. You control all of life by not existing anymore, in the sense that you thought you did. When the red line starts to go down, and you start to get worried, if you will have the courage to say, you know, I have been living in vanity and pride and egotism all my life. This is evidence of it, because, boy, I was real confident last week, but look what happened this week. There's something wrong. No, there's never anything wrong with the line going down or the stock market. There's something wrong with me, because I am responding to this in a way that causes me pain. Now I'm getting smart, real smart. For the first 50 years old, I'm getting smart for the first time. It took all this time. So I say to the red line, you do anything you want to. I don't give two hoots what you do. You can go up to 100%. You can go down to where I'm wiped out completely financially. This is serious. You understand? It's, it's funny, but it's also serious. You do anything you want to do. When you can really do this, what? You're free. What? You're free because you're not resisting what you have called evil. Now, what is evil? We covered that. Evil, <coughs> evil is anyone or any event that opposes what you want. And you want it because you want this person or event to confirm that you're a great, successful businessman, or the loving mother of five children who got best grades in the class, and all that stuff. Nonsense. When you see through this and say to all of life, to every unexpected event, you do what you want to do. It doesn't involve me, and it doesn't. How, how can you be hurt by anything whatsoever? You tell me. How can you be hurt? You can't be. Because you have died, or I have died, to all my illusions, to all my false identities about who I am. If I don't have any idea who I am, then, then I'm not going to try to get you to confirm it. And I won't get angry at you if you don't confirm it, because I don't exist in this false sense of self. You understand that most people never ever get close to what we're talking about. 
Remember, you're hearing something that, that most people don't want to hear. They wouldn't understand you just, just to begin to understand that we're living from a false sense of self. That doesn't make any sense to them. Because they are they're cemented, cemented to their ideas of who they are, and therefore they, they are their own punishment. They whip themselves 50 times a day by clinging to this. So from now on, when you go out into the world after this meeting, even while you're talking here, maybe during the discussion period, if you will do the first thing of looking back on yourself and say, why did I get confused, or why did I feel hostile, or why did I feel uh, well upset, whatever it might be, about what was said, do that first, then track it back further. You will always find that in back of this is an idea of who you are, and therefore, as to how other people should treat you. Someone mentioned, I don't know, in a recent discussion that who are your friends in this world? Your friends are the people who agree with you, and your enemies are the people who don't agree with you. See how foolish this is? This is why, <coughs> this is why the more frightened a person is, the more eager he is to, to find uh, an ally in another frightened person, and they form an organization of some kind to protect and promote their own interests while calling it, you know, something for peace or for God or something like that. You have to cut yourself off entirely from every other human being on earth. Then, also as we discussed, you will be in right relationship with every other human being on earth. And then you won't go around, or I won't go around, hurting people as we did before. Then we will have this genuine conscience that we should have. Because at last, <coughs> at last, knowing that I am not this fictitious person, I'm not eager and anxious to get you to confirm it. And I don't get angry when you don't confirm it. I'm free. I'm out of it. And you can behave toward me as you want. This is up to you. You have your problems to solve. I can't solve them for you. You have to solve them. If you want it, I'll tell you about it. But you have to make the first move, by the way. Not me, otherwise I'm using you to... You understand? When I have no idea of who I am, I'm in perfect relationship with other people, with every event. There's nothing to prove anymore. And what... Why didn't I see this when I was 20 or I went all these years paying this terrible price when I could have had it many years ago, at least we're starting now, instead of going through it. We finally got the point we don't want to pay the price anymore. I think we'll open it up. We have, we'll take about 10 minutes in questions and answers, then take 5 minutes. So let's discuss this openly. You have questions or comments? Then after 10 minutes we'll take a break. And then come back again for the net other part. I, I'm a little confused, Vernon, about <clears throat> your statement that we isolate ourselves from everybody. Uh, that uh, I'd like you to talk some more about that. Right. Because I'm, right. I'm seeing, right. in my mind, we're all one. And right. there seems to be a contradiction right. there. I, I know. I, we have to use words which are always have opposites to it. First of all, obviously we don't mean to isolate ourselves physically. We have to be in relationship with each other, even if it's nothing more than by bread at the grocery store. So I don't mean physical isolation. When I am no longer using you in an attempt to confirm <coughs> an image I have of myself, I never lift a finger to keep you in my life or not to keep you in my life. This is you. My, my, my chief duty in life is to free myself from my own neurosis. Call it what you want. My own confusion. When you're in this state, then the question of isolating yourself or not psychologically in any way doesn't come up. Because, indeed, it is a oneness. You are a oneness. Therefore, how do you have any problem with anyone else? I'll give you an example right in this group here. 
group meeting like this. We're discussing these things. Anyone who comes here is, is never urged to come back. This is up to you. Therefore, we are in right relationship with each other. I am in right relationship with you right now. Because there are no demands on you whatsoever. This is your life. But you're finding out if you want to change it, completely change it, then that's up to you. So, if I may use myself for an example, I'm not sitting here, the, the word isolation or non-isolation has no application whatsoever. Because there's no, no attempt to get anything, no demands, none whatsoever. Then, in this state, if you happen to be in a family, you have a wife, five children, then you're in right relationship with them, even though they may not be in right relationship with you. You're not isolated in the sense that you are either rejecting or accepting them. Because you're not using your wife or your husband or your family to make you feel secure. Then if they want to leave you or stay with you, that's up to them. But you don't have a problem with it. You have a problem only when you have a problem with yourself projected out to the other person. I believe someone's at the door. Did that uh, cover it any? Yes. I'm... Any further question on it? No. Okay, who else? Yes. Um, I'd like to ask you, now, if you're aware, you know, you, you watch yourself, you become aware of mm -hmm. your, like, your feeling, and something's happening to you, and you get really uptight about it, you know, and you say to yourself, now, this is ego, you know. You want these people to appreciate what you're going to do, what you're going to say, and you realize this. And then it still persists, you know, and you know what it is. You know what I mean? You know what it is, and it stays there. And you say to yourself, now why don't you go away? I know what you are. You're just an ego, you know. <laughs> you know. So why don't it leave if you're aware of it? I'll tell you why. Because if a car, an automobile, is parked at the top of a hill, and it's a long, long ways down, several blocks down to the bottom. This momentum of the automobile has tremendous force, tremendous persistence, tremendous power. It'll knock, it'll knock another car out of the way. It'll knock a, a fire plug out of the way. I'll, I'll get to the application in a minute. It has tremendous force, tremendous power, and it persists, which is why, why it's very difficult to wake up to do this, what we're doing. But we're on the track, and it can be done, and must be done. See, if you go to certain places, like maybe churches, they tell you it's very easy. Just to, just believe. Hey, that's easy. I don't have to do a thing. I can just believe and, and be surrounded by people who believe in me and God will take me to heaven when I die. You have to work tremendously hard at this. Every day, every second. That's why. Because the sleep is so deep, it's so persistent. Now I'll answer it in another way. Concerned with this mechanicalness. What, what is the opposite of mechanicalness? It's consciousness. To simply see. To see. We covered the difference between thought and consciousness, and I'll go into it very briefly, which will enter into this. All thought is mechanical, it's repetitious, it comes from memory. This is why a person who behaves last. Thursday, he behaves today the way he did last Thursday, because he's living in mechanical habits, which on its own level is okay. But to break mechanicalness, you have to understand what it means to be conscious. To understand what it means to be conscious, you have to understand what it means to die to your self-images, so that this image is not controlling you on the level of mechanical thought. And when I tell you, the next time you run into a shock, just to just look at yourself and don't do anything about it because an attempt to do will be thought itself in another disguise, maybe as, a, as God helping you, inspiring you, which is another trick of the minds. This is a moment of self-awakening. All shocks of any kind are moments of self-awakening if you use them properly instead of turn into getting bitter or hateful of what people have done to you when you were so nice. It's hard work. We're here to work real hard. I'm working hard right now. You have to work real hard. And you will find 
the actor working properly, as you, you know, what you said, that's okay, fine. You will find that you can't do a single thing. This is good. This is good. Because you see that you're not deceiving yourself anymore, that you are this wonderful, oh, I never get mad about anything. People lie, oh, they lie. When you despair, over breaking this becomes great enough. Good. Now you begin to break it. Because you're not inserting a false notion about how you can change yourself into the picture. And so you stay there in your utter discouragement and despair. <laughs> you, you have to see it. You will see it. Work hard. Continue to work hard. And after a certain period of time, you will get a different feeling. Because now your feelings are beginning to change too. And for now, for, for the first time maybe, your emotions are beginning to work in your favor to help you wake up. Whereas before, they were working to keep you asleep. You know, angry, resentful, suppressed. You know? Now your emotions are beginning to help you to wake up. And you will feel it. You'll get a new feeling. And I will, t I will be able to tell by the questions you ask, by the expressions on your face, when this happens to you, when you start to change. You're feeling it now, some of you. And when you go out of here, I'll tell you again what will happen. So you use this for observation. Some of you are excited right now. I know you're properly excited. Properly. When you walk out of here, remember what you learn. Remember the feeling you have now because it's a right feeling. You're not getting any lies here at all. None. And you sense it. So don't, don't let, shall I say it? Don't let the <laughs> devil take you over when you get out there. Remember what you learned here, and this will, this will aid you, this will keep you going down in the right direction. Because this is a true feeling. Yes? Um, you described the process, process of coming to see. The process of what? Of coming to see. You were answering the lady's question in the red uh, spider about, uh, you know, first sees uh, one's reaction. Yes, seeing the reaction. And then uh, she kind of, you know, why doesn't it go away? Yes. And then, then you mentioned that, that what follows later is this despair when you know you can't do anything, right. etc. Right. Um, and earlier you spoke of uh, the death of identities. Right. And rebirth. Now, would you go in a little more, would you follow a little farther with this following from the state of despair? What would you, would you keep playing with that? It is very difficult to explain this to you in words. I've said this before. But if you'll experience it, you will know what it is, and you'll also see how difficult it is. Because I can't explain to you the scent of a, a rose. It's in a, a, a different sense, an entirely different sense. And you have to see it. And then when you see it, you and I will won't even have to mention it, because we, we both know what we're talking about. However, let's you approach it. See, and this, this goes much deeper than this question. When you see that you were never really born, then you'll also see that there really, in one sense, there is nothing ever to die to. Because it's all an illusion, a fantasy to begin with, which society put into our minds, and which, because we were young and gullible, we didn't know any better. The whole structure is false. That this man... Pardon me, could you wait till I turn off? Oh, yes. Oh. If we will stop at this moment, we'll cover this because both take... Let's connect both questions on here and talk a little bit about it. I wonder, may I ask uh, both of you ladies who asked those questions to look at yourself. Now, now this is self-work on your part. To see if there was any, any possible anxiety involved in the questions themselves. Any question asking anxiety means that it would be very difficult for you to understand the answer because 
question ans asking anxiety is on a certain level. It's not wrong to ask questions in anxiety because you have to ask where you are. You can't go to another level. So first of all, see that there might be anxiety in the question itself. What would happen if you gave up your anxiety over questions about death, reincarnation, eternal life? What, what would happen if you just dropped the question? Ask yourself that. If you dropped the question, you wouldn't be anxious to find an answer. But why is it difficult to drop the question? Because, again, we always come back, we always come back to the same thing. What's going to happen to me? Now, have you ever asked yourself who this me, this self is, that you want to continue? Do you mean to tell me you want this miserable self to continue for another <laughs> eternity or something? See? You ask yourself who the me is, this label Tom Jones with all his, his labels, and Mary Smith with all her labels, who this person is. And you will find, as we have found in the early part of this discussion, that it is simply a bunch of accumulated bundle of ideas that we have about ourselves, which we protect against all enemies, in quote marks, against all comers. If we begin to work, as we have discussed here, facing the shock instead of running away from it, we will begin to die to the label and therefore to the question of what happens after death. Then, as was brought up, there will be no time involved. Because when you talk about eternity, you are now bringing the question of time into it. And time does not exist. We have, we have calendar time and clock time for everyday convenience. convenience. But if I die right now, right this second when I'm sitting here, to all my false ideas about who I am, then time does not exist. Therefore, the question of eternity or reincarnation it's gone. I, what do I ask about it? I don't have a question anymore. What we really do here, is, instead of answering the questions, answer questions, is to <clears throat> solve them, to get rid of them at the source. See? Is it based in anxiety? And what's in back of the anxiety? What's going to happen to me? What if you don't exist as you think you do? There goes the whole thing. Boom, it's gone. You're split free. You're out of it. Time does not exist for you anymore. Time exists on the level a conditioned thought. Thought, you remember we said thought operates in opposites in yesterday and tomorrow, in youth and old age? If you do not live in thought, except where it is necessary, like gardening or doing your work, then you're living in consciousness and awareness, which is always right now. When we're living in right now, there are no questions about what's going to become of me, because there is no time, there is no future. I'll add one more thing regarding time, then we'll go on open it up. When you're living right now, this second, then five minutes ago or 50 years ago does not exist to you. Therefore, you are free of it. You're free completely, regardless of what society says, by the way, that you were arrested for something and, and uh, had a shameful experience with the police or that you behave very foolishly or very cruelly with other people. Don't cling, don't cling to self-punishing emotions. Regard, maybe you did uh, treat your children, your husband, your wife very badly in the past. Don't you, don't you dare cling to this. This is another false move. Because if you can feel shame and regret, this is still egotism. You're still saying, I exist as an awful person, but at least I exist. Cut it out. Dare to die to it. See how, may I repeat it, this is very beautiful. See, you're free right now. Time does not exist. When you see it, when you see it, and something comes up, a little thing. You, you were astonishingly rude to yourself, but to a, a person out there. But you watch it, you real quick, die to it right now. Don't hang on, don't defend yourself. Die, drop it, drop it. Now, you see that you actually were rude, but it will not repeat itself tomorrow. Because you have learned to die to it and see why it went on. Okay, go ahead, anybody. 
Is there ever any place uh, outside for a little white lie? For a little white lie? Yeah, I mean, you. I know you have to be completely honest with yourself, you know, and then sometimes you're in relation to someone, you want to spare their feelings or something, and you'll find yourself going off, you know. Why do you put yourself in a position with other people where you are in a situation where you think you have to do that? Now, we're approaching it differently. Why do you have a relationship? Well, I'll tell you why. I'm insecure. I want to be loved. <laughs> I want to be liked and appreciated and all that. And so I, I flatter you in some way. Or I tell a, a white lie to you. No. You be totally free of everybody. The question will never come up. You won't, you won't have to be intense and, or make a decision, should I say this or shouldn't I? Because when you feel tense, if I don't flatter him or her, he or she will leave me. If I don't buy get her all kind of candy for her birthday or do nice things for her, you, you understand. If I don't do all this, then he or she will, won't like me as much and maybe might leave me. Maybe I can guarantee that I won't be afraid that you will leave me by, you know, you understand? Be free, the question never comes up at all. Now you behave with a conscience, with a real conscience. You're not doing that, that other person any good by, by compromising yourself with them. You're just making them worse because you yourself were false. You pass that falseness on to them and you're teaching them wrongly, by the way. Of course, they, 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 not, they don't understand this. I had a situation like that. I lied yesterday, uh, or Thanksgiving. Uh, I wanted to stay home. I didn't want to go out to anybody's house for Thanksgiving. Okay. And uh, I had a girlfriend who's a very forceful a friend who called me up and asked me to come up, you know, to come over for Thanksgiving. And I knew if I said no, I'm just going to stay home. I knew it would be an hour of harangue. Oh, come on, you can't stay home. You, uh, what's marriage and all that sort of thing. So I just said that I was going out already to someplace else to, to miss the hour of haranguing. I lied so that I could do what I wanted to do without... Uh, <laughs> now, then afterwards I thought, well, now, is it, is it wrong or right to lie in that situation? Uh, what do you want from her? Too much. I don't see her very often. She only called me on holidays. Have you ever noticed? <laughs> have, you, have, you ever know, have you ever noticed how, how differently you behave to people that you don't want anything from than those you want something from? How would you like to be able to behave toward everybody as if you didn't want anything from them? What? Would that be a relief? I don't say be rude to people. Be be polite on that note. But where you don't have this little tension. I want, for example, I wonder if they'll find me out. This line. Why don't you find out what it would be like, everybody, what it would be like if you didn't want anything from anybody, which does not mean you're a hermit, which is just as neurotic as anything else. Then there'd be, there'd be no, no white lies, no compromise, because you're not trying to get anything from them. Now, you, you have to go a long ways in this. You have to go a long way. You have to be able to first say, I am going to set myself free. Come what may. If you leave me, you leave me, period. Psychologically. Not necessarily physically. It doesn't mean you run away from your wife or husband. It means inwardly. You understand psychologically. You may stay right, right there where you are physically. You work right where you are. Don't run away. That's just another escape. Stay where you are and work with it. Be smart. But say, I'm going to be free of you. Now, how do you do that? By simply being free of yourself. So that, and it will happen, I will tell you, it will happen, you're going to lose a lot of people in your life, thank heaven. <laughs> they have been draining you, and it's your fault, because you have been equally draining them, going over and blabbing about nothing, exchanging presents which neither of you wanted to buy. Then, then, because you are one with yourself, you're one with everybody, 
and there is never any conflict between you and them. They may have conflict toward you. They could be angry, because they will be. Everybody is angry against the first person they see or upset. But you look at them and you understand it, because you see yourself for 20 years ago or 10 years ago, for one thing. But you are free of it. You don't have any of this little, this little petty conflict. Now, he, he mentioned working on a small project. You have a wonderful little project to work on. Sometime, sometime try telling the truth. No, I just want to stay home and just see what happens. <laughs> just see what happens. And there, there's sudden shock silence. You used to uh, try to lie about it or get out of it. You bear your own shock at telling the truth for once and see what happens. You do it enough times, the whole thing will vanish to be one. And it doesn't go to the opposite of arrogance, which is simply another escape. Then you're really a decent human being. You don't get arrogant and hurt people. Question, comment? You mentioned in your book about uh, do nothing. Right. Uh, when you are in forceful situations, uh, either with your boss or loved ones or so on, you take no, and this is absolutely no rebuttal. Right? Let me put it this way. I, I understand that. Does God, consciousness, truth, reality, have anything to do, or is it simply aware and there and seeing what is going on? It understands. Not doing simply means to understand, to see. When you understand, there is no false you doing anything. It is pure, it is free, and therefore intelligent. It is seeing what to do. You don't do anything. Now look at the opposite side, where false personality tries to do something. It is simply trying to protect itself in any particular situation, or expand itself, wherever it might be. If I've understood this enough to give up my false personality, my false sense of self, and something happens to me out in the world, whatever it might be, if I simply see it without self-reference, and there's no self-reference because I have died while I'm alive to this false self, this phony self that's been parading around and keeping me miserable, I have nothing to do but to understand consciousness, see? I'm free of it now. I don't have to do anything. Then, on the any other level, the physical level, I will know how to behave. I will, I will never be negative about anything. If I get laid off, and I thought I was going to get promoted and I get laid off, I will be a free human being, even though laid off. <coughs> then, on the physical level, I will do the intelligent thing to go out and apply someone else, where else to make enough money to keep bread on my table. Otherwise, I get very hungry. But I am never bitter. I don't destroy myself with bitterness as of what you owe. You don't owe me anything. I'm out of it. In answering his question, when you say, um, he, he, he said something about, let's say, an incident, either with the boss or it doesn't matter, an incident occurs, yeah. and he was talking, you can't do anything. Uh, you say, like, God, does God or, you know, pure consciousness do anything or does it just observe and understand? Now, I'm going to make a statement and then, you know, explain it or something. Um, does it follow, in other words, then, that if, if man didn't react and create these, all these incidents, understand it, all right. experiences in life, okay. then God or consciousness would have nothing to observe and there would be nothing to understand or observe. Yeah. If it, there would, excuse me, go ahead. Excuse me, go ahead. I really didn't get a, a question out of it properly, but I will comment on it, all right? 
In other words, if we didn't create an illusion, okay. if there was no illusion, then God or consciousness would have nothing of which to be aware. Have you ever heard the phrase? Or uh, true or false? I mean, you know, can you go into that? You are here on earth in a physical body at the present time. I am. Okay. If I am living consciously, if I've been awake all day long, and all night long too, by the way, then what have I to do except to be a free, happy, self-unified, and therefore other unified human being? My aim is to be a free, understanding human being. Everything else to do, I do, but it is never a problem to me, because I have no longer created a problem by creating an opposite. Being one with myself, I have no enemies. I created my own enemies for 30, 40 years and didn't even know it. And I created them because it's necessary to create you as an enemy, otherwise I can't exist as myself. As I die to myself, I die to you as an enemy and vice versa. Nothing to do but be aware and not be afraid of death because you've already died to illusion that you existed in this way. If I see that I was never born, except in the illusion that I was born as a very nice looking man, 25, successful, this is what I've been living by, I will also be afraid of its opposite of growing old and being unsuccessful. So I die to my identification of being 25 and handsome and wealthy, now I, I do not live in fear anymore. I have nothing to do but simply to live. And if I have any anxious questions about what I should do, then I can die to those too. This is a life of no questions, because the false sense of self is not creating the question out of its own anxiety. Questions don't come up anymore. What's the question? What's the problem? You don't exist. The only problem you have ever had, I've ever had, is right here and right there within ourselves. When I am clear, my world is clear, because listen, you, you connect this. You may make some connections. I am my world. There is no me and my world. I am the world itself. Why? This is why pe people, people say, I can't figure it out. I'm a very nice person, but nobody ever treats me as nice as I treat them. <laughs> I don't think I have to comment on it. Well, um, you know, I've studied your book and read it and reread it, you know. Now, I've become very aware, you know, and of course I'm <laughs> equal, and uh, I'm aware of all these things, and then what do I do? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Still, nothing. Well, I mean, it's like I'm back to where I started. Like I'm aware, but I don't do anything. Now, this is lessening, but when you become so aware of all these things, you're aware of them, and then... The most difficult, I, I, I get it, I understand. Certainly, if you're beginning to watch yourself in daily life out in the world, and you see yourself behaving badly in some way, even though the other person doesn't see it because your smile remained in place and you didn't feel like smiling, but even though you observed in your mind that you're dividing yourself between an exterior smile and an inward resentment, and you've reserved this, this, is, this, does not, this does not end it. And I told you one reason why, and I'll tell you another reason why. The mechanical car coming down the hill. It, it wants to keep coming. That's a law of science. What is it? Body in motion tends to keep going. Mm -hmm. The last thing a person wants to give up is exciting feelings, which includes self-pity, shame, humiliation, hatred, feelings of violence. We are in love with strong feelings. This is one reason why simply being aware doesn't work as yet. You have to go farther. You have to go to the point where you are no longer in love with being hateful. You understand? With getting a strong feeling out of anything, out of watching that business chart go up, 
Because you're excited about it going up, you're going to be depressed about it going down. The two have to go together. So can you give up? Can you die to every kind of a strong feeling? And don't call it love and don't call it inspiration. Can you be deceiving yourself? Simply watch the feeling. You know what you will find, among other things? You will find that what you called excitement was simply nervous agitation. You will find that it's enormously difficult to give this up. Because to give this up, you have to give up an image, an idea about who you are. And, so, and it's a fear of death that prevents us from giving up these strong emotions. There's so many things to do, so many, but we, we get them as we can. So many things to remind ourselves of. But would you say that, like you say, when you're nervous, you know, you, you go around saying, uh, people do, well, I do, and I say, well, I'm the kind of person I get all excited. Oh, you know what I mean? all right. Now, this is ego, right? You've already labeled yourself. I mean, this isn't yet image. Yeah, you know I mean? right, right. We don't want to give, give this up, that, this identity that we are, uh, <coughs> that we do. How many, how many people do you know who say something like this? Oh, I'm so excited. I don't have a minute to myself. The kids come home at noon and my husband. She's trying to tell you that she's living a very busy and worthwhile life. And she is a miserable woman. I don't have a minute to myself. She's trying to tell you something about herself. See through it. Then see if you do the same thing in your own way. All this is, is a terrible fear of running away from looking at herself or himself. People, people will do anything to st except stop and look and see the state they're in. You'll never, don't try to stop it. It'll shove you out of the side. So go on that way. You covered something in your talk before, prior to questioning, and um, I found it for myself. It, it was uh, comparatively simple to lay out what a, you know, my negative thoughts and negative feelings. And I also found that I had so much ego going for me that I was trying to solve them, and it was like a uh, vicious circle, you know, mm -hmm. covering one neg neg uh, negative thought with another, <clears throat> do something type of thing. I find the hardest thing in the world for me to do is do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, really, you know, just to, okay, this is, uh, this is it, and then I kind of drop it. Mm -hmm. But I wonder sometimes, uh, I try this, uh, I call it purging uh, of the ego, and uh, it may, is this why it comes back so often, or is it this uh, automobile going down the hill that it will come back? It, it's a number of things, and we might add to that. The ego is, it is the greatest actor or actress on earth. It can switch a costume and a mask in a flash, just like that. And you may think that you have got rid of it and it simply put on another mask, the most common common being a good person mask. Have you ever noticed how good you are right after you've done something bad? <laughs> You're trying to relieve That's guilt right. for one thing. Pardon? That's right. Follow it. You, you, you're rude to your wife or your husband and so you bring her chocolates. <laughs> you think that you have changed. You're simply, you're simply on the same level because now you can say, well, at least I'm a repentant person. At least I'm trying. You haven't changed anything. Because tomorrow you're going to be mean to her again. You haven't changed a thing. So do remember, among about 50 other things, that the ego, this false sense of self, can change its roles very quickly. And it can be very impressive in public and to ourselves. It can appear, well, it can appear to be very religious and very good and can burn human beings at the stake in the name of God. So ask yourself, am I projecting an image of myself or will I have the courage to simply see that I'm thinking? If you can see that you're <coughs> thinking, this, this takes time, it won't happen overnight, and say, I'm going to stop thinking it's possible to stop thinking and to be in another state, which is above thinking. Then you have to go back to thinking again to drive your car and so on. Whenever you're in a, any position where you can normally do so, say to yourself, I'm going to stop thought from running mechanically. It's maybe okay driving the car, but you can do. And I'm going to simply sit here and be aware of myself. And you may find, to your great astonishment, 
that you're sitting here with your hands clenched and you didn't even know it because you were unaware of yourself and a tense thought had come through your mind. Watch yourself watching television and if you're identified with the television show or the movie, you will find yourself doing all sort of strange things while it's going on. You know, the, the crime is about to, you, you tense up, you break thought. Hey, I didn't know I sat like that. Or you watch somebody else. You'll see them all identified with what's going on, on the screen. While you're watching television and, and, the, and the football touchdown is just about to be made, if you have the courage to do it, break your thought of being identified. I hope you make it. You just sit there and be aware of yourself sitting there. This will produce a shock, a healthy shock. See, this thought doesn't want to stop. It wants to keep rolling downhill. But you do this, you do it 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times. You'll be able to see that when negative thought wants to take you over, to put it this way, you, you can give it a, just a polite refusal and say no, and it can't take you over. It can't destroy you like it used to do. It can't make you miserable and angry and afraid like it used to do. Because you've risen above it then. You'll only be living in consciousness or practical thought, or two. We'll take a few more minutes. I really uh, a lot on the hand in her question, uh, because I've, I've observed this too, the ego, you know, switching roles and, and right. uh, images, you know, just been very cunning, well, so cunning sometimes. Uh, um, you were giving an example of a, you know, when one is reacting, for instance, watching a television show or yeah. something or whatever, and the moods change or the, you know, the ego switches, uh -huh. it just switches like that. Now, I was saying something about it being very cunning, too. Um, they're very deceitful, very deceitful, yes. the ego. Yeah. And, um, um, so when you say, like when, like when I sit on the bed, <laughs> and, and I'm looking at the television and I'm, I see something, you see, I see myself, uh, right. you know, right. identifying or something. Right. And then I ask myself, uh, well, who, who sees this? Uh, is this another ego again? Uh, you know, or else uh, suppose I, I understand something, I understand. or suppose I think I understand oh, something, oh, even a little right. bit. Then I, I question and say, well, that's probably an ego, too, to think I can understand something. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I just get so fed up. <laughs> the part is not the whole. Now, follow this. I, I understand exactly. I'm watching television or myself at work, and I see this thought. And I, I say to myself, well, I am not really this thought. And you are really not. You are not. You are not your thoughts. You are the whole, which includes thoughts, includes body, includes Mars, it includes that gentleman and that lady. See? You, with a capital Y, has no opposite. If I have an I and create a you, I've divided myself, and that is not truth. I see myself reacting to something on television or out, out in life. And I simply see it as a thought, but I don't identify with it and don't like it because, I, because I've because i understood that this has been punishing me all my life and I thought it was exciting to uh, do whatever I did or be the important man. And remember I said, if you let the thought go instantly, then you are free from it and then it cannot form an identification, it cannot form a label. But you have to be willing to give up who you are. Then you simply see the thought without identifying with it. And then, what can I say? Then all I can say is that there's no problem anymore. And then, all these wrong thoughts gradually decrease. They gradually fade away because you're not using them to bear you up, to make you feel more secure. Then thoughts pass. Then they fade out as they're supposed to fade out. Then you are not who you thought you were, and therefore you don't have the problems that you thought you had. You, you, do you know that you don't have a single problem sitting here right now? In fact, you don't have a single problem. You don't have any problem with you. 
but the mind is operating incorrectly. And that's what we're trying to correct. So that we don't have any problems at all. None. No exception. If there's any exception, it wouldn't be right. There's no exception. No problem. Old age, you name it. Yes? Something unusual has been happening to me. <clears throat> the I have a bad feeling and I'll relax and become aware of it. And it used to be that it would identify itself I would know if I felt yeah. um, angry or hostile or or if it's in case okay. of a good right. feeling. Yeah. But lately it seems that uh, for some and, and I don't and I can't understand it, that the feelings don't want to a, a negative feeling doesn't want to identify itself to my uh, and I'm I'm beginning to wonder if maybe maybe I was deluded in the first place. And that is that what I thought was a feeling of depression or whatever uh, really was might have been something else. And I'm wondering what's going on and uh, my feeling about that feeling is that it's it's a temporary thing and the, the growing experience that I'm going through and that it will pass. Well, all right, all right. When when you're depressed, you're depressed for just one reason, one reason only. Well, all right, many reasons. One, because you're asleep. You, when you're depressed, you're asleep. You're not conscious. You're asleep. Two, because you're thinking. You're on the level of thought instead of being above the opposites of thought. You ever notice when you're depressed, you want something to make you undepressed, and so you do something to try to make you feel better? Then you're depressed again the next day, so you find something else to make you feel better, whatever it might be. To wrap this up, because our time is running short and I want to comment on something else, simply be aware of your depression without trying to go to an opposite, which the mind naturally will try to do. The, the opposites are okay on their own level, but do not try to escape it, but stay with it. Then you'll understand that there's nothing to do at the moment but to be depressed. If you will stay depressed, when you are depressed, you'll begin to understand it. And this is the beginning of dissolving it. We have just about three or four minutes left, and I want to ask you, did any of you do the work project, and do any of you remember what it was for last time? <coughs> yes. What am I doing right now? Right. We cover that, we've been covering that all the time. The project, and I'm going to, I'll reassign it again, so that you can do it again, was simply this, to ask yourself, what am I doing right now? That's all. You don't do anything about it. Remember when we sat sitting here before a meeting start, and I asked if you were aware of what you were doing right now? Were you aware of being anxious over the silence in the room? So, do that again during the next next period. Ask yourself, what am I doing without doing anything about it? Just watch. Nothing. Nothing. Because you'll be tempted to do something. You'll be tempted to feel elated after feeling depressed. Say, I am depressed. See it, you know. It's really not I. But say there is depression there. Then let it go. Drop it. Dare, dare to drop depression. Dare to drop feeling gloomy and feeling left out of life. Feeling, dare to drop the idea that you have been cheated by life. That the other people have so much more than you. Dare it and see what happens. You'll find resistance. Beyond the resistance to this is freedom. That's enough for today. <laughs>